things are weird. I'm trying really hard to look at the camera so you feel that you're, I'm looking at you, but actually you're over there. So when I'm not looking at the camera, that's when I'm actually looking at you. Unless, of course, I'm looking over there when I'm looking at something completely different, possibly one of my dogs. Um, so welcome to our first Fundamentals of Contract Law online shoot. Um, I'm just using the standard meeting software for doing this. I'm excited. I've upgraded to the webinar software for when we actually have classes starting tomorrow. Um, I've even created my very own Fundamentals of law, uh, Contract Law bingo sheet for so we can all play along when we're doing our meeting tomorrow. Um, but other than that, I'm completely overwhelmed. I actually think in some ways it might be easier to do a webinar from home than it was to do live stream and a class at the same time. But um, the people who attended the live stream, they were pretty, they said nice things. So clearly it worked for them. Um, I don't know what, uh, yeah, I don't know what it's going to be like. Um, I did get an email the other day that suggested that I should make sure the lectures are no more than, longer than an hour. Um, I think they want me to just create more videos otherwise. I'm not going to do that unless you guys really scream at me because you've already put that, well, the face-to-face -face guys have already put that three hours aside and the online guys have already budgeted time to look at those extra time. So anyway, look, Way I said it, we're in this together, so we'll work it out together somehow. I'd love to have three-hour classes just for something to do. <laughs> well, you know, my, my bingo sheet does include, you know, being able to see each other's pets, perhaps catch people drinking wine, eating food, whatever it is that you do. Um, this is water. There is no gin. I don't like gin. Um, but, um, yeah. Can't promise that I don't bring wine to class anyway. You just wouldn't know. Um, anyway, on that note, I need to remind myself I'm being recorded. Um, so drop-in shoots are for you. Um, what do you want to talk about? Anybody got a question? Gabby, go for it. Um, when we are using quotes from judges, yeah, and they're really long, but for instance, they outline a criteria. So mm -hmm. for instance, there's six points that make a criteria for estoppel. Yep. And each of the each of the points has to be satisfied, which means the whole quote kind of needs to be in yep. the essay in order to make sense. But might yeah. end up being like um, two hundred words. How do we deal with that? Well, firstly, try not to deal with it because we are all much more interested than, in what you think than your ability to cut and paste quotations. Um, we are interested, sorry, now I'm going to close the door because there are other people and my dogs won't want to wander. But I, I don't like the noise outside. I get distracted. I think what, are they, what fun things are they doing that I'm not involved in? It might involve nachos at this time of night. Um, so, firstly, we're much more interested in what you think. So, um, and you learn more by paraphrasing or summarising. That's not to say that there won't be occasions when you really need to pull out the whole of the quote. But you've got to make sort of judicious choices in relation to this. So, firstly, if you really need to, Let's, that's the easy thing. Um, have a look at AGLC4 for the way that you quote. Uh, so in particular, and I'm using my memory here, but um, long quotes, so anything that goes over three lines, you need to in, indent. The indent I'm not sure about. Uh, make small, use a smaller font. And much to um, the disappointment, is the word I will use, of the Turnitin software, you do not use quotation marks. Why I say that's disappointing is because Turnitin is a very blunt instrument. And so what it will do as soon as you put in a long quote like that, particularly because it's looking for the quotation marks, it will say, uh, oh, well, what will it say? It will basically say, 
you have failed uh, quotation because it only understands, you know, normal stuff that uh, when I say normal stuff, like, you know, it, it's better with the big hitting um, uh, referencing styles like APA or Harvard or MLA or whatever. So it just, it just doesn't get it. Yeah. That means you get a bigger turn in score. Um, that means, well, if it can find the quote at all. Um, and that means I get a whole lot of red when I look at your report. But again, I'm not an idiot. So I actually know that you've just quoted the whole thing from a case and it makes sense. So you don't have to worry about that. Like I said, turn it in blunt instrument. Yeah. But what other strategies can you use? Sorry, I get distracted by myself. I'm looking at you now. Okay. So <laughs> I guess I guess what, what I'm taking from that is that like your expectations are not that we're a hundred percent to the letter, but that we maybe take only the bits of a quote that are really relevant. Yeah. To what we're talking about, even though there are other bits that are important, but they would just yeah. take too much space, take too much explaining. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things you might do is look at the way your textbook does it. Okay. One of the things I like about your textbook is it, it's got this accompanying case book that's got big reams of the cases, but almost all of them you will find that there is a summary of the salient point referring to let me use an example. There's a couple of paragraphs where it talks about Brambles and Justice Hayden's decision in Brambles. Um, and so it sets out what the criteria is. It's accompanied in the case book by a couple of pages setting out in some detail what the criteria is, but it's summarised, it's condensed, it's brought out the salient bits where the words are really important because they they become part of the term of art or at the end of the day they just couldn't be said in a better way then they've quoted them um and it's textbooks actually a good way to look at the referencing as well okay. notice the detail in the formatting of how referencing happens within so the textbook there are very few three line or more quotes in there they've really got them down to an art form um, and they're woven in and it, it's really quite well written. So that's, that's a good example to look at, particularly writing lawyer to lawyer, which this first accessible that counts task uh, is. Does that answer your question, Gabby? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Cool. Um, I just wanted to mention in passing to I, I, panicked a whole lot of people this week because you've got emails or alerts or god knows text messages could have been on the vic fire safety app for all i know it seemed to alarm a lot of people that you got an incomplete on your first task um very few people did the first task um a couple of people in oua who did do it actually put it in the wrong spot and I didn't notice. So I defamed you in an OUA email, basically slandered a lot of you. You can tell I don't remember how the torts work um, and said, nobody in OUA did it. And you guys need to put your socks up. Um, turned out to be untrue. Um, you just put it in a place where it wasn't going to come to my attention. But I think I've sorted those people out. In relation to the larger group, um, it was just me doing housekeeping. Um, I just switched them on to say they're, in, they're done so that that whole row was dealt with. Because of the way the technology works, it is a considerable pain in the butt for me to give you feedback in any kind of efficient way unless I make those dis, uh, discussion board tasks accessible, which means you get a number if you look at it, it actually just says complete or incomplete. But when you look at the rubric, you will see that you get a number and it means that I've got the rubric there to just type in uh, quick feedback and to give you a note on it. Um, I think it's just easier for you to get a sense of what's going to happen when you're doing proper assignments if I do that. But what it means is if you don't do it, then you're risking getting emails that say you haven't done it, which again, I'm hoping just motivates you to do it next time. Frankly, you know, I would be crippled uh, in a time sense if all of you did them every week. Like, it would just, it would kill me. Um, I'm kind of banking on them not being that important to you so you won't do them, but working on the basis that if you do do them and get them in on time, hey, 
I'll give you some feedback. So, um, yeah, like I said earlier on, we're in this together. Um, I am very, I had no idea that it was going to stress people out and that was never, ever, ever my intention. Um, it was just making it easier for me. I can stop that. I just then get alerts telling me I haven't marked stuff or that I need to remind people to do things. And that's all I was doing is turning off my own alerts. But I can live with them because I know they're meaningless. So anyway, sorry about that. Um, but at the same time, even though I just whinged about it, do them. If you've got a chance, have a go because I, I look, I won't get those people who did them to out themselves. To be frank, they weren't awesome, the ones that I saw. There was no, none of them really stood out and said, oh my God, how am I going to keep this brilliant law student entertained for the next 11 weeks? Um, because they clearly know more than I do already. Um, but again, there was, I think, the people who did do them, I hope will have valued the feedback and advice, which was, yeah, you're going to need to go deeper here. On the whole, most of them, uh, they, they, they weren't referenced. There were, wasn't enough evidence supporting the statements that were made. Um, and, yeah, they were, like, they were done in a quick and dirty way. Um, most people actually got the answer right. Part of the problem with that first one is too easy. And so people just sort of basically did it. Um, but didn't actually go into the kind of depth that I'll be expecting. Um, but again, it wasn't accessible. So why would you? <clears throat> so um, just in reference to that, um, in exams, would it be enough just to write um, blah, 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 and then I say cite? Um, yeah. Carmel and carbolic smoke ball, because yeah. will. Everybody yeah. will cite that at least once, especially in an exam. Uh, yes, so in an exam, we don't want footnotes. Yeah. Like, let's face it, actually, the reason the rest of the world uses in-text referencing is it's so much easier to read and work out what's going on, right? Um, but we're not allowed to use that. So you're going to have to think about how to go. But in um, an exam, you will just be, remember, you'll be handwriting. So you will just be writing the case now. No. Now, I say that, and we all must be thinking at one point, what the hell is going to happen with exams in a COVID-19 world? And the short answer to that is no idea. No idea at all. Um, smarter, wiser, higher paid people than me will be making that decision. And until they make it, I think we're going to have to work on the basis that you will have exams in all of the Presley 11 subjects somehow. What that actually means, I don't know. So... Um, I've quite possibly, of course, now just made you more alarmed and alert than you were already, but I just don't know how it's going to work. Yeah, Gabby, just so, now. So for the, for, for the discussion things, um, we, don't, we don't have to say what the case is about if we cite a case. We can just say, as we saw in blah, 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 and that's yeah. fine. Okay. The rule in Brambles requires that we apply the test, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Or the test for determining is blah, 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 bracket, Carl Hill and Carbolic Smoke Ball, close bracket. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so what I will do tomorrow before we actually get into the consideration stuff is I am going to do some feed forward on writing a memo for your assessment task. Uh, so I will actually, I'll, I'll probably spend about an hour on that. We'll spend about an hour on that and then two hours into consideration. Um, sounds like a hell of a lot of time, doesn't it? But that's just historically how long it's taken me. So, um, yeah, and I can't help myself. Um, I will be giving you tips for writing memos in the real world because I care about that more than I care about your assignments. But it's okay for you to care about your assignments. That's a good thing. So we... Uh, Tiffany, you've raised your hand officially. That requires me to be paying attention to this screen. I'm learning. How can I help you? Oh, I didn't know if that was how I was supposed to do it. For I'm just doing this, which I've got to say actually works better if you're on ah, camera. Okay. If you're not on camera, doing that, it's not going to work. But uh, okay. Tiffany is on camera, but go for it. I, look, I'm cool. open to everything. <laughs> so for our first assessment, does that relate to offer acceptance and consideration? That would be telling, wouldn't it? 
Okay, so we can't know. <laughs> so let me um, let me give you some heads. So basically, mm -hmm. um, in I can't actually remember what part B says, um, but I also I am not a psychopath. Um, so <laughs> there is actually you got no reason to actually believe that other than me <laughs> saying it. And who other than psychopaths go around telling people that they're not psychopaths? Oh, anyway. I gotta stop thinking this through. Um, I am not interested in, at this stage, in you having to go through stuff that is completely irrelevant or completely yeah, sure. you know, battle stuff that you haven't had any hand holding with in class. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt that the key issue relates to contract formation. In fact, the mm -hmm. specific question you've been asked to answer is, is there a contract? Sure. Um, and one of the things I will caution you to do is to answer the question that has been asked. You might yeah. feel that you need to provide some additional information or ask some additional questions or throw in some additional um, research and that may or may not really add to your presentation. But if you do not answer the question you have been asked, you are unlikely to pass. So mm -hmm. that is the key thing. And again, in the real world, even when your boss asks you a stupid question, you need to answer the stupid question before you sway them into what the real question might be. Sure. So the reason so why I, I uh... and, and I'm not saying this is a stupid question. What I'm saying is you need to, it's a formation question. There is no doubt that formation relies on the elements, agreement, consideration, certainty, and intention. And okay. we know that offer and uh, acceptance, if we're looking at an agreement problem as relating to offer and acceptance, we know that the offer needs to contain what I like to call the DNA of the deal. It needs to be able to incorporate what the consideration will be. What is the price for this promise that is being yeah. offered? What it needs to have sufficient certainty as to what it's about and it needs then it needs to demonstrate some sort of intention to enter into a legal relationship now again not a psychopath the chances of those issues being significant is not high but it's also not impossible because yeah. again you've noticed how much we keep going backwards and forwards and one of the reasons we spent two weeks on agreement is because you needed to have a bit of an understanding or at least enough to be able to do meaningful research on the others. So mm. I'm not going to give you the answer. No. Um, so the reason why I asked was because before we started doing consideration, I thought, oh, consideration means that you've had sufficient time to think about it. Ah, uh, what a great, actually, that's a, I've never heard that before, but that makes complete sense to me. You had <laughs> oh, no, I felt like an idiot. <laughs> Well, yeah, and so I, then I thought, I mean, that's why I say in the class, let's call it price for now. Let's, yeah, let's yeah. call it price. Yeah. Yeah. So then I thought, okay, so if I'd been really organized and like I'd done a draft of my assessment before I'd got to the consideration section, how silly would my draft have been? So I guess I'm going to get a sense of how reasonable is it to work in advance, like to get organized. I would, um, well, you've only got, 24 hours until we, or less, until we meet yes, again. Yes, until we do consideration, but I'm thinking, so, is, so am I going to do the next week and go, oh, my God, that's not what that means. Uh, well, it is not stupid to have read everything through consideration because... Okay, great. Because we've got consideration. Uh, yep, okay, fantastic. Starting tomorrow. Um, and it is, yeah, I, I think the formation elements at the beginning you know thinking about that is important unfortunately the lovely chapter that i think would have been really helpful to you all still hasn't been digitized and i am like driving everybody a little bit insane about trying to get that sorted i've now come up with an alternative which might be helpful um in fact if any of you sorry just up uh, there with me i'll show you this This is my new favourite textbook in relation to this stuff, um, well, as in for the broad overview, because I just want something that is that gives you kind of the, 
the language I want to use is like the lid to the jigsaw bo puzzle box. Okay, we're looking at each of these pieces individually, but something that is the lid to the box. And chapter two of this uh, book, which is kind of, it's just, oh, is it chapter two or chapter three? No, chapter five. You would, I'd find it. Chapter five is contract formation. And I'm um, sorry, I'm, I'm not nice to my books. <laughs> It's covered in highlighter, uh, largely to pull some slides together when I was preparing them. But it's got a nice overview of pretty much everything that you're going to learn in this subject in the next one. So that would be quite useful, um, but um, I'm not sure if you can get it online. So this is Stuart Swain and Fairweather. Another good place to look would be Halsbury's Law of Australia, Laws of Australia, or the Lexus, the other database which is just called Laws of Australia, which you'll remember. In fact, I can show you right now if you like, given that we're online, why don't we do that? Um, I will just find a screen. Screen one will do. Um, I'm assuming you can see. Um, Okay, we're going to the library. Don't have any idea why I felt the need to sing there, but there you go. Oh, I'm assuming you can see my screen. Nobody said no, and I'm not looking, so. Um, here we go. If you go to the business and law area, and you go down to law, Bit of a giveaway, isn't it, really? Encyclopedias and dictionaries. Holsbury's Laws of Australia and the Laws of Australia. They're very similar. You might just like one better than another. You clearly need to log in. Then you get to wait. Um, So contract law principles, you're just getting high level. So I, I'm just suggesting, oh, I went into criminal law principles. Sorry about that. Chapter eight. Oh, chapter seven. Formation. So if you've had a look at the general requirements you know the formation elements right up front you can see how tiny they are here's one on equity so equity is likely to be the long one look two or three paragraphs so it gives you kind of just a high level summary overview um, that would not be a stupid thing to look at for elements that we haven't covered in class yet um, wouldn't be a stupid thing to look at for elements we have covered in class that I haven't explained sufficiently clearly to you as well. Um, but yeah, that can be a good way to get that overview, to look at the jigsaw puzzle box. But much, much, much more interested in what you think and how you analyse and solve the problem than I am in your ability to regurgitate lots and lots of case names. So one of the things that often happens early on is that I see lots of students give me lots and lots and lots of cases and, you know, tons of footnotes and just pretty much every case we've read gets, uh, gets cited somewhere. And it's really hard for me to tell if you know which is the important case or not. So be judicious in your choices. Um, again, thinking back, you know, when you had to write a history essay in high school and effectively you were told um, for every um, statement of fact, you need to support it with some kind of source. So that what the law is, is a fact. So the law will either come from a piece of legislation or from a strain of case law. So every time you have a statement of fact, you want to support it with a case. Yeah, Gabby, how can I help? You need to unmute, there you are. 
Do we, you know, like in, in a lot of other essays, you might find, um, you need to find one uh, source that agrees with your point and maybe one source that disagrees or has a slightly different interpretation. Do we need to find multiple, do we need to look at multiple different cases? You know, one case says, well, this is how this worked out here. And another case says, this is how this worked out here. Like how... That's a really, really good point, actually. It's a really good way to think about it. Um, here, you're, you're solving a problem. So think about it, even though it's clearly not, think about it more like a uh, applying it as a science, even though it clearly isn't. If there, once you've reached a point of view, and, I, and I'll be talking about this when I talk about writing the answer, and, and one, of the one of the suggestions I'd make is solve the problem before you start writing. Because if you start writing first, then you will um, you fall in love with your response and it gets harder for you to take out the stuff if you've gone down the wrong uh, burrows and you end up with very wordy essays. But that aside, um, if it is a controversial point, there might be two different ways of looking at it or more. And in such a case, then you will need to look at multiple cases and say, well, you know, the English cases do this to this point and then Australia's gone this way and the UK's gone that way. And But at the end of the day, you know, we're seeing more of a lean towards the UK way or an American way or a bloody, I don't know, Middle Eastern way. I don't, I, whatever you want to, uh, use the analogy there or you might say well nothing ha nothing relevant has been decided in relation to this for you know since 1910 but the world has changed in these ways and so for these reasons I think that it would be more likely that a court would see x instead of y um, and you might want to support that with some legal scholarship if you find it um, if you, one of the things that you do in any essay, basically in any assessment, if you can find somebody who is peer reviewed and think of judges as being like peer reviewed, um, who agrees with you, that is a very good thing. But an even better thing is to find somebody who's peer reviewed or otherwise that you disagree with and that you can find a logical and strong argument for why that other person is wrong, particularly if it's supported. So the second, the first of those, those is pretty easy to do, but it needs to be controversial. Like, you know, I, I don't want to read an essay or a memo that which is about how the whole common law contract law system is wrong, needs to be overthrown and the anarchists are about to rule. Um, as interesting as that might be, um, it's like, it's not going to help you pass the subject. So, um, is that helping you? Sorry. I feel like I'm talking about 25 th different things at once. So yes. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. So Tiffany, I, I saw movement. I didn't know whether you were talking to me or somebody else. Um, if you've got a question for me. Hi, can you hear me or? Oh, Sarah, I can now. Yeah, yeah, I can Hi, Sarah. Hi. So I think you commented that we should, um, a lot of these cases are very, very old. And I think I would, I don't know if I know how to go about finding out if it's still um, good law, you know, some of these old cases. Okay, so um, again, Think about how to deal with that logically. I will. I will run a um, with the Law Student Society. Actually, I will run what I call the. I like to call it research like a ninja. They like to call it research masterclass. Like, anyway, um, but we will do that after you've done this first assignment. And the reason that I like to do that is because I want you to have had the opportunity to have practiced research so that you've got a sense of how it works because you have had some research training. But think about it logically. Um, clearly primary sources beat secondary sources, always have, always will. Um, but one of the key resources that you are, are using is your textbook. So your textbook, uh, 
I'm not sure that you would call that technically peer reviewed, but we, the textbook that we have has some preeminent contract law scholars who have put it together. So as you look there, you can actually look at the cases that they have chosen to discuss and look at what's, you know, the extent to which they question those arguments. So that gives you some clues, right? Other things that you can look at are um, case base. So case base does a, um, uh, oh, what do they call that thing? Um, it's actually linked in this Westlaw thing that I've just looked at. Sorry, I can't remember. Um, our first point. So first point will actually tell you whether or not cases have been cited before or afterwards. Um, one of my favourite tools is Jade. I don't know if the librarian showed you that. JAD.io. Um, why I like Jade is you see in your textbook, you know, cases have been cited. What Jade will do is it tells you with um, what paragraphs have been cited. So it takes you to the most salient point. So, you know, if we're talking about brambles, for example, brambles get cited all the time, or woolen mills. I'm trying to, just trying to think of cases that we've looked at that have been cited regularly. Um, but when you go into Jade, it will actually, you can actually see which paragraphs of the case have been cited the most. So you can go and have a look at those. And then you'll find that most, most of the databases, I'm pretty sure Ostley does this, Jade definitely does, Westlaw I'm pretty sure does it. They have a list of citations for the cases. So if you find the case itself, then you can see, has it been cited subsequently? Westlaw from memory even flags it. It will tell you if it's been overturned or decided against or otherwise. Now, of course, we're dealing with some really old English cases. So you've kind of got to find an Australian case that has been cited, that has cited the English case in order to sort of see if that chain has continued. But that's what the research is about. You don't look very happy about that, Sarah. Oh, <laughs> This is exciting. This is you. This is you. We lawyers were just made to do this. These old English cases, they're buried and oh, I find them, yeah. Yeah, they're turgid and some of them are really, really hard to read. And then some of them are just laugh out loud funny and you find yourself just remembering the words. There's a couple that we come across later. I think when we're dealing with um, intention, and Justice Aitken talks about how it's so hard to find love in these cold courts. Um, yeah, so, and Justice Denning always says, he's got a kind of a literary way of writing. Um, and I often find, um, I, I quite like Kirby, Justice Kirby's decisions. I find them easier to read usually. Um, but these days, modern ones, for what it's worth, uh, once you get out of these early subjects, you'll find that a lot of the modern high court judgments are really nice and crisp. They use really plain language. They number things. They cross-reference. Um, they're, they're much, much easier to read. So a good place to look for an example, bizarrely, is um, tax law, where because tax decisions are so, like, they're happening all the time and that's changing all the time, so there are a lot of them. And it's really easy to find some high court decisions in relation to tax. And, you know, tax is not easy to understand, not interesting to most people. Oh, I wasn't looking. So I only just saw a fleeting redhead go past. Must put redheads on my um, bingo sheet. Uh, yeah, and you'll see that they're actually really quite easy to read compared to the contract ones. Questions about content, about offer and acceptance. Um, actually, Holly, was that you waving? I'll go to you first if you weren't. No, you weren't. Uh, Tiffany, off you go. Is it really possible to just contract out of a jurisdiction? That sounds really strange to me. So you can just say, like, we live in the same country, but I don't want to contract with you. I want to do one in Burundi with you. <laughs> you are um, thinking like a lawyer. Um, as between the parties, you can agree how and where your disputes are going to be.
be litigated. And as long as you agree with that, continue to agree on that point at least, there's really not a lot that can stop it. When you get to international law, you will see that uh, effectively um, the, the, the courts decide what jurisdiction applies. So American, and, and actually statute will do that as well. Americans are really good at saying American jurisdiction applies no matter what. So um, in fact, to the point where particularly in relation to financial matters and paying tax, um, if you are in partnership with somebody who is an American taxpayer, according to American legislation, um, the IRS, the US IRS, has the right to audit your accounts and find out whether you need to pay tax in the US as well. So that has created all sorts of havoc for uh, investment funds, superannuation funds, international legal and accounting and consulting practices all over the world. Um, so, you know, the law can do that. Um, also, something we will talk about a little bit later on is you cannot contract out of the law. <laughs> so you can't actually say as a, so a provision in a contract that says, no matter how bad our dispute is, we will never litigate, will not be a binding clause if there is an enforceable contract. Mm -hmm. Ironically, that clause might be evidence that there was never any intention that the parties <laughs> wanted to be bound by the law, right? Because yeah, I get that. Yeah. But usually the clauses are around saying, okay, so, so how they tend to be written is everybody is in agrees that if we have a dispute, we want to solve it as quickly as we possibly can. So if we have a dispute, then we're going to try and get together and solve it. If we can't do that within 24 hours, then the CEOs of both of our companies will have to get together within three days and try and mm. solve it. And if they can't resolve it, then we'll go to mediation or arbitration and we'll do it this way or we'll appoint an expert or we'll do blah, 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 blah. Um, but at the end of the day, you can't contract out of it. So, and also agreements to agree will not be enforceable. And we spoke about that a little bit last time we met, that an mm. agreement to agree actually wouldn't have sufficient certainty, if nothing else. Mm. So, yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah. I, 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 at this early stage, we have a bit of a tendency to um, oversimplify a few things. But it is yeah. really good to be thinking the way you are and thinking like a lawyer. And just because I don't point out something that might be different doesn't mean, you know, you've got the whole of the story. We're just picking up yeah. one jigsaw puzzle piece at a time. Sure. Cool. Any more questions? Holly. Yes. Hi. Sorry. That's just going off Tiffany's last question. I don't remember anywhere in the readings or in the lectures what that is referring to, like putting into a contract that the two parties have to do it in some particular jurisdiction. I like, can't remember exactly where we ended up talking about that either. I do remember mentioning when we were in that classroom last week something about agreements to agree and it must have come out of a question because that is something that oh. we'll cover when we get to attention uh, okay to attention. i think i haven't understood the question <laughs> <laughs> That's no, I right. that part. okay don't worry my, um, i'm confusing myself my personal uh kind of mantra around this stuff is the difference between a good lawyer and another lawyer is not knowing the answer. It's actually knowing what questions to ask. Um, because anybody these days can work out the answers. The availability of the information is not difficult anymore. Um, you can find this information. What actually will distinguish you as good lawyers from others will be actually taking that time to work out what problem is it that you really need to solve and 
part of that over the course of your degrees, it's not all going to happen just in the first couple of subjects, is working, is listening for that language to know where to sort of start. So language like agreements to agree uh, or, you know, offer and acceptance equals agreement or the words like elements, things like that, you start to build up that kind of vocabulary that will help you focus on asking the right questions. Um, so there really is no such thing as a stupid question and not understanding the question doesn't matter at this stage because not everybody will understand the questions. Um, and in fact, I, the, I don't not ask a question because you're not sure you understand the question. Find the words and we'll get there together. Okay, anything more? So um, one of the things, if you haven't got anything more, I do have a little bit of a something prepared for you just in case everybody was sitting there looking quiet. Uh, one of the things I thought I would show you, which is I'm likely to show a bit in the um, memo discussion, is just an approach that I take to working out what the problem is. And so I'm using the Zeta and Susanna problem. Just give me a second and I'll share the screen again if I can see where it, my button is. Can you hear me? Can I just ask one last question? Oh, please, please, please. Oh, just um, the, whether the assignment's due on the 5th or the 8th. In one location, it says the 5th. In another location, it says the 8th. Are oh, you eight online, seven. are you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, chances are there's an error in the online. That would make sense. Um, I think for online students, it should be the Oh, no, eight. I'm not online. I'm not online. Oh, you're not online. Sorry, clearly you're online now. I'm online now, uh, yeah. No, no, no. Um, for online students, it should be two days after the face-to-face -face students. Oh. Um, and I have a feeling, um, I, and it's just, a, I woke up in the middle of the night last night thinking about this and thinking, I wonder if I actually fix that. Uh, and the reason I usually make it a little bit later for the online students is because online students don't get the content as quickly as face-to-face -face students. Although this time around, you can do that if you want to because we're live streaming. Anyway, um, I it should be the Sunday night, whatever the date is that's the Sunday night. And if it's in two places at the wrong... Uh, but whatever is correct is the, the source of truth will be what the calendar says. Um, if, if I have typed it the wrong way somewhere else, I will check. Um, but let me actually have a look at that while we're speaking. Let me find. Fundamentals of contract law. Oh, you're um, 2524, yes. Really, we have this kind of process that we have to do and we have to type everything in, but then we have to put it in. I, I don't actually... Un when you have to enter something in twice, there's just so many opportunities for things to fall between the cracks. And I just wish it wasn't like that, but it is. And the mistake will most likely be mine. Um, yes, it should be the fifth. Oh. For, uh, should be the fifth for face-to-face um, -face students. And it should be the eighth for online students Kath, it appears my... to have been entered the wrong way round. Yeah, I'm face to face and it says the eighth. Okay, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to make them all the eighth. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Because that is my mistake. Watch me. I am doing it right now. Face to f uh, Online students are just going to get it as the eighth. I will have to go and no doubt change things somewhere. Um, which includes most likely the um, uh, the actual problem task itself. Yeah, that's me. I've clearly thought that red was face to face and brown on my colour coding was um, OUA. I, no, the other way around. My face is red. Um, 
Okay, I was going to just quickly show you something, just as a methodology. It's as much as anything just because I want to make sure you've got something to talk about. Um, oh, what screen can you see? Can you see some, what looks sort of like some post-it notes? Yes. And quite possibly your own faces or some of them. Um, I'm going to still leave your faces there because that makes it easier for me to see you. Um, so basically, this is pretty straightforward. This is the Zeta and Susanna problem. And what I had done is just basically worked out, well, what are the facts? And one of the easiest things to do is to just, with post-it notes, just create yourself a list of what, the facts are and the order that they happen. So Friday, oops, sorry, moving things around. Believe it or not, this is better than me standing on my, I actually usually do this on the back of my door, like um, on the back of a door with post-it notes. This is what I do when I'm solving problems for my own clients, right? Um, I don't bother doing it here because nobody needs to see it, but I will do it on the back of a door with a stream of post -it to just get my set of facts. So once you've actually worked out what your timeline is, okay, i got some feedback there. I might mute a couple of you just to see what's going on there and you can under, okay, that's better. Um, once you've got your um, facts sorted, actually matching facts with issues. So if a fact doesn't have an issue associated with it, then it's probably not a material fact, you don't have to worry about it. But if you've got all the facts in a row, one of the things that you're doing by just saying, I've got facts here that are yellow, I've got, sorry, I'm being too smart for my own video. I've got an issue here and they're related. Then I've got a list of the facts and I've got a list of the issues. And then what I can do is going to match it with an offer as well. That's an offer, sorry, with a, with a rule. So Tiffany, you're giving me this face that makes you makes me feel like I'm like I'm being a little bit crazy. But can you see what I'm trying to do here? Is I am listing okay, like what are the facts? Is there an issue? Now sometimes issues arise out of the way the rules work. So one of the other issues that I have here is 24 hour is like actually is that a 24 hour period for the offer is sent or is it that it's read? Now actually that itself, sorry that did relate to the facts itself, um, but then actually the way that the rules will apply to that as you actually work it out, it really doesn't matter because there was no consideration for that offer. So I'll go through the problem here. I have been in this situation in previous um, first in a tune because this is usually a problem that's just been done where we're literally solving the problem bit by bit but um and that's because that's the question so i've got sort of everything ready to go as you can see um but really all i wanted to do is just show you how simple it can be to just list everything out match it with the issue match it with the rule reach a conclusion and it feels a bit babyish in some ways to do these multi-colored um, post-it notes. But for those, particularly those of you who are visual thinkers, you will find that it's actually a really easy way to make sure you cover your four devices. Yeah, little tip for those of you who come to a shoot. Questions, concerns, frustrations? Well, if we don't have anything more today, so if we look and see if there is a hand raised, there's somebody in the chat. What does that say? Oh, what am I doing to you the online? An uh, app is called Miro. Uh, I've had an education license for it, so I think I get it free for, um, and I can invite people to share this collaboration thing. Um, but, yeah, sorry, I'm a geek. I'm sadly used to read real time board. Um, another thing you could do this with would be um, fake post it notes in um, PowerPoint. I've done that more than once. But quite frankly, if you do this by yourself, you don't need an app. You just need some post it notes. 
um, and a bit of wall space or a door. As you can see, I'm a big fan of post it note. Um, and I'm all over the place. Uh, but uh, that's my to do list, um, which makes sense to me and nobody else. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, is just asking how the audio is being fueled. It's an interesting question for me as well. Good, bad, and different. Bit shaky, terrible in the last five minutes. I do hope that's not me. <laughs> All the last five minutes. Okay. Um, I could be my son uh, online gaming because I did tell him I should be finished by about what I stayed. Uh, but um, yeah, hopefully the webinar stuff, it will work a little bit better. Ah, I don't know either. Let's stop. Is it better now? Uh, no longer sharing the screen? Ah, interesting. Okay, I've got a that's really interesting. I wonder why. Okay, well, that's something we're going to just have to watch tomorrow when there's a lot more people involved. Um, but hopefully, because, yeah, you're going to want to see PowerPoint slides at a guess, uh, but we'll work with that. Anyway, look, I hope this isn't all getting you down too much. It's going to be interesting times for all of us. In a roundabout way, I'm actually seeing advantages, but... Um, that's the nature of my personality, I think. Um, I do hope you guys are talking to each other anyway. And um, yeah, this is just one of the ways that we can communicate. So yeah, I'm going to leave you be. And um, I will see you at about 5.30 tomorrow. I'll be starting dead on time. If you have to come and go, that's fine. Just make it work for you, okay? Um, and lovely to see some OUA people as well.